And talking about the the uh, the act of water baptism, which is what we're going to be doing next week. So some of this may seem like, well, I'm baptized. What does it matter? You might meet somebody that you can share this with. You know, the first thing they need to know is Jesus. The Bible says that for God so loved the world, which is is you and I. And then we got saved, and at that point we received Jesus. And though the neat part is that we want to get away from commu uh, communion. We want to get away from religion. I was going to wear a big old robe today because sometimes big old religion keeps people from actually meeting the Jesus that you and I know. And, and, and so there's a whole lot of condemnation that seems to thread itself through church and sort of if you do enough of this and if you do enough of that. But I went here and, and I, I said to a friend one time, I said, you know, back in the 80s we used to term it like going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than sitting at McDonald's makes you a big man. And so uh, you've got to recognize that, that this all happens because the Jesus in us is in him we live and we move and we have our being. So when Jesus died on the cross, he shed his blood for you and I. And so the beauty of the blood of Christ is, is the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.17 that you actually become a new creation. So if you've been recently born again, if you've recently invited Jesus to come into your life and wash your sin away, the Bible says that you're actually a new creation, which means unheard of before. Unheard of before. Now think about that. Because a lot of times you get up in the morning and the enemy will spend a lot of time telling you what you are, what you are, what you are. And you need to begin to stand up in the morning and say, the Bible says I are, and the Bible says I are, because you're not this old person. You're not just some old Christian that somehow God decided to let get saved. The beautiful part is because he first loved you, he's welcomed you into the family when you received Jesus. But it's an actual act. The next part about that act is the Bible says that confession is made unto salvation. With your mouth, let's confess Jesus as Lord. With your mouth, you, you, you receive Jesus into your heart, and with your mouth, you share Jesus with somebody. You tell somebody about the Jesus that now lives in you. The Bible says, in Him we live, and we move, and we have our being. The word in Him is, is roughly 130 to 140 times throughout the New Testament, which tells me that when we're in Jesus, you're actually a new creation, unheard of before, but now in Christ you are. And so if you go through Paul's revelation, you can start to realize who you are, and it's what you are. And you need to find those scriptures that say, in him, in him, and in whom we have our being, which tells us what we are as a Christian. All right? So if you say, well, I'm sick all the time. No, in Christ we're healed. All right? In Ephesians it says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us. That's actually past tense with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. But you say, but pastor, I don't see those things in my life. Well, no, you maybe need to take a look at the word and say, according to the Bible, it says, by faith we receive these things. By faith we reach out and receive them. So you need to, by faith, receive Jesus. Your mind will still say, well, but you're an old sinner. Your mind can tell you on your way to church today, there's no point going today because after all, boy, what is it last night? Something else. You need to get that under the blood. I'm not suggesting it's okay to do whatever you want. But the beautiful part of the blood of Christ is it actually removes from the past to the present. And we need to embrace that and recognize that. And you receive that by faith. Sometimes you almost don't even feel like, you know, oh, I don't deserve this. But the beauty is this. It's not about what we deserve. Because if we're truthful, we don't deserve squat. But the beautiful part of Jesus is he chose us. He chose us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And that meant that Jesus, from the beginning of time, was with the Father, making a plan to redeem man from a lost, sinful state. That's just the truth. They knew Adam was going to blow it. They weren't like, oh my goodness, God didn't tap the Holy Spirit and say, you better go tell Jesus, because what are we going to do? They're out there in the orchard, and they're going to eat the wrong tree. Unfortunately, that happened. Yes, that wasn't God's best, but how I many know we don't live up to God's best? But Jesus was coming to redeem mankind from day one. Then he says, you can be, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, we become a new creation. Unheard of. Maybe you need to stop talking about your old creation. Because the Bible says you have what you say. The words that come out of your mouth are life or death. You're not just this, and you're not just that. 
you are a born again Bible believing believer that Jesus moved onto the inside of you and if Jesus is living in you you're not some old tin can junk you're a born again believer you're a Christian that means Christ like absolutely I agree that there are areas of our lives that need to be changed and improved and the more we sow our lives into him the more our lives are we're going to want to be like him you become who you hang out with Honestly, I heard a joke the other day because old Boz stuck his head out the, we've got an old basset hound, and he stuck his head out the back window of the car, and I had my head in the front window of the car, and somebody said, we look alike, because he hangs out with me all the time. <laughs> but, you know, as funny as that was, I thought, oh, that's probably true, because if you've ever seen those pictures, you do begin to look like your spouse, or sometimes you can compare, you know, not that we're dogs, but it's like, oh, there's a resemblance there, you know? Maybe it's the hair, I don't know. Ears, maybe, I, I, I don't know. But you're a new creation. So that's the first part. Then the second part is we want to talk about the act of water baptism. And some churches will sprinkle and some churches will do lots of things. I'm not going to take away from what they do. We're just going to look at what the Bible says to do today. And so what we read is what we're going to do. And so if you want to go, please, if you would, um, we're going to go to Matthew 3, verse 13 to 17. Matthew 3, and we're going to go through and explain this. Now, one of the things as you're turning there to recognize is this. For you and I, water baptism seems fairly simple. You're going to go uh, next week to Waterford Ponds. We're going to go out there in nice warm water. And, and we're, going to, we're going to submerge you under the water. And what that does, what, what that is representing is the old nature is being buried. Obviously, we can't bury you alive. Okay, <laughs> So we're going to place you under the water. And at that point, you're leaving the old nature behind. We've been given a new nature a new being, a new person. And so as you're, and then when you're, the Bible says that we're raised with Christ, and we'll look at those scriptures in just a moment. But in a nutshell, you're leaving the old dirt, the old past behind, and you're recognizing an inward work by doing an outward work. But in Western countries, it's, it's easy for us to do this, but I want you to recognize that, it, that it's a, it's not so easy, for instance, in the Soviet Union or Chinese or in the Eastern Bloc believers. Uh, this was really signing a death warrant, okay? There's a, that, I mean, you're, you're just absolutely in trouble because you have to hide your Christianity, all right? And it's like that all over the world. There's, there's places that embrace Christianity, and if places aren't, then obviously the act of water baptism, you're stepping out and doing an act that isn't a popular thing, all right? And, and, and so you need to recognize that. A wedding ring, when I do a, a wedding ceremony, the ring represents, an, uh, uh, if you would, an inward work with an outward sign. And this is much the same as water baptism. It's recognizing that it's kind of like a funeral. Not to take away from, from you know, what we're doing, but you're burying the old nature and coming up into a new nature. And so you've got to look at yourself as a new person. A new person. And you know what? You're going to spend most of your life probably correcting yourself. Probably going, okay, I'm not just that old back talker. Or I'm not just that old drunk. Or I'm not just that old smoker. Or I'm not just that old womanizer. Or whatever it is. Whatever setback that seems to struggle in your life. You need to recognize that God thought so much of you, he said, I'll die for you. And when you recognize that, we then take water baptism and we bury our past and we come up into a new person. Which is why Joseph, on his own, changed his name. He was Pierre, now he's Joseph. And so that was simply an act of an inward work coming to an outward work to signify a new person. Now, I'm not saying you need to go and change your name. But that was an awesome thing that he came up with on his own to recognize who he is. That's awesome. Okay? Don't be thinking of what you're going to name yourself. You've got to listen to the sermon here. All right. So, Matthew 3.13, you're there? And so we're just simply looking at biblical examples of what Jesus did. We can find lots of examples of what religion did, but let's just look at what Jesus did, okay? Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you're coming to baptize me? But Jesus answered and said unto him, Permit it... Uh, Permit it now so, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And he allowed him. And when he had been baptized, Jesus come up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and aligning upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. 
So the obviously, the number one thing you need to do is we need to live to serve God and to please God. And so we see that God, even His own Son, it was fitting for Him to be water baptized. We see that God is well pleased with that. And so that needs to be something that you don't just sort of shove away. The very act of obeying the Word of God, you know, we, we always say, well, it's so very important to get saved, born again. You need to know Jesus. The Bible says that there's heaven to gain and, and hell to shun by, by receiving Christ. And so we recognize that, but this is just as important. This is something that Jesus saw fit to do. They could have just said, well, you know, he's really spiritual enough, it's okay. And sometimes we as Christians make excuses for not acting in obedience to the Bible. But if we can't start here, it makes it very difficult to find those other areas in your life where we can walk in obedience. I mean, great that she said, well, pastor, I'm going to be walking in obedience and praying, or I'm going to walk in obedience and tithing, or I'm going to walk in obedience by loving my neighbor. Those things are wonderful, but here's an example of that God says, you need to be baptized. And so we see that. Now, here's the one little challenge. If you read a little farther, in chapter 4, it talks about Satan then goes on to tempt Jesus. Whenever you step over into the things of God, whenever you step out to do more for God, you will come under attack. You're not going to get some little bed of rose to just sit in and go, wow, life is just wonderful right now. Anytime you rattle things up in the spirit realm, anytime you begin to step out and do more of serving God, more of walking the word, you are going to see that the enemy will come and try and pull you away and try and attack your life. You need to recognize that. All right, because that's probably one of the most difficult things with new Christians is they get born again and then go, wow, this living for Jesus is really difficult because Satan's not happy. He's not going, well, this is just great. No, he's not saying that. He's like, you know what? We need to undo what God has done in their life. And so that's why it's very important. And, and I have to say, uh, the group that we have right now has been so refreshing because plugging into God, fellowshipping with God and putting God first is so very important. Sometimes we kind of, you know, the word says, uh, we might get there, but talking about, uh, it's actually in Mark chapter 4, the sower sows the word. And so the Bible says that immediately Satan comes to steal the word. He will come and try and pull that word out of your heart. It's no different than if I was to preach to you today and say, you know what, we're going to pray for your marriage. We're going to believe God for great things. And so you leave here supercharged, and as soon as you run into somebody in the coffee shop, they might be there, well, your marriage is never going to make it. It's never been any good anyway. And what that is, is I'm not saying they're possessed of Satan. But <laughs> Satan will slowly pull the word out of your life. He will he'll throw stumbling blocks in your life to go, well, you're right. It's not going to work. It can't happen. Nobody else seems to believe it can happen. Therefore, I guess it won't happen. And so what happens is you begin, your confession goes from being real awesome to, yeah, you're right. It's not going to work. And Eeyore is then revived. And you need to, you know, you need to begin to say, no, wait a second here. God said it. Therefore, that settles it. We can go forward. We can see what God can do. And so don't just listen to the storm. Don't just listen to what the enemy says. Don't just listen to what the crowd says. We talked about the spies this week. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, there was you know two two spies that said they're going to the land that said the land was already promised them. But the spies said, well, you know, two of them said we could. The rest said we couldn't. The crowd is always going to seem like it's more popular. You're going to have to determine yourself to say, you know what, we're not just going to go with the flow. So 